Britain's first canticle 
um, written very much in the sway of the discoveries that he'd been making since the late 1930s and very early 1940s concerning the music of Purcell. I talked slightly about this last time, but um, it's worth remembering what exactly he thought about the music and how it changed the way he wrote his own. One of my chief aims is to try and restore to the musical setting of the English language a brilliance, freedom and vitality that have been curiously rare since the death of Purcell. In the past hundred years, English writing for the voice has been dominated by strict subservience to logical speech rhythms, despite the fact that accentuation, according to sense, often contradicts the accentuation demanded by emotional content. Good recitative should transform the natural intonations and rhythms of everyday speech into memorable musical phrases, as with Purcell, but in more stylized music, the composer should not deliberately avoid unnatural stresses if the prosody of the poem and the emotional situation demand them, nor be afraid of a high-handed treatment of words which may need prolongation far beyond their common speech length or a speed of delivery that would be impossible in conversation. It doesn't take long listening to the opening of that canticle where you have the two sort of um, voices out of vertical alignment, if you like, and this untrammeled um, writing um, in the middle of it, which um, uh, is all as written, by the way. <laughs> it is meant to sound like that, but it really is incredibly unmoored by this stage, and it was the idea that Britain would have two voices go apart and then bring them back at the end in that lovely, lovely chorale that you hear. So he was, he was really literal about the, the influence that a composer such as Purcell could have just on speech um, and on rhythm. And he thought that this was a real problem in the, uh, in the 19th century English composers who were far more interested in almost a hymn book mentality, uh, uh, an approach towards harmony, which then affected the way that they approached poems and, and affected then the settings that they made. It's also extraordinary in that, which is, is an incredible love letter to Peter Pears, his partner by then of around eight years, um, that of course in the critics when, the, when it was first performed um, noted nothing untoward about this um, rather <laughs> obvious, I would have thought, uh, statement of commitment and love and attraction and instead commented on the, um, the, the lovely acoustic and the, <laughs> the beautiful piano writing. <laughs> Which <laughs> reminded me of only the one, the one funny critic I think I, I, I just laughed out loud at was um, uh, when I was at Artistic Director of Wigmore Hall, I invited the wonderful soprano Anya Silja to come and, um, and to talk about her life and career and also to perform a, a few things and, um, and she had a cold and didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't very, very well and, uh, and so begged the forgiveness and understanding of the audience. And the critic um, in the Financial Times, I think, said, um, I found this much easier to do by concentrating on the pattern in the Wigmore Hall's carpet. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so the critics um, noticed this, this freedom and this great vitality in Britain's writing um, and of course because of the time uh, didn't comment very much um, on uh, the subtext of Britain's operas which already by this stage, don't forget that we've had the performance of um, Peter Grimes in 1945, we've had the performance of uh, Rape of Lucretia in 1946 and we're about to have the performance of um, uh, the Albert Herring. Uh, so all of these deal in some way or another with uh, incredible betrayals at the heart of um, human behaviour. Uh, betrayals were happening in Britain's own life. Uh, this, is a, this is a photograph from December 1946. It's interesting because um, uh, from, what we told, from what I spoke to you about last week uh, about the performance, the premiere of Peter Grimes, we know that it was a fairly rough and tumble affair. Um, and that, that the orchestra wasn't really up to playing it, the singers weren't really up to singing it, and, uh, uh, and the staging was pretty cramped and, and, and not much money spent on it. Um, uh, so Britain's uh, predictable response, possibly, because even by then, even by now, uh, he's, he's developing a very sort of thin skin and prickly response to any criticism or perceived lack of support. Britain's response is to, in um, December 1946, is to get together a number of his colleagues from the... Uh, uh, the performance of Grimes and also in this instance the performance of Rape of Lucretia in Glyndebourne and to discuss what they were going to do. Um, Glyndebourne, um, John Christie down there had actually put a lot of money into uh, both the first production of Lucretia and then taking it on tour. And it's very interesting that this was Britain's idea. He thought that it was important that opera be toured to the provinces which is something that he had learned in the Second World War doing these tours himself where he'd, he'd go around and play on rackety pianos and uh, present 
repertory that people would just simply never have heard before um, in those places. So um, his idea was that it was the Glyndebourne. This is incredibly prescient. Was a portable brand that could be exported, and um, and John Christie thought it might be a portable brand, but on someone else's dime. Thank you, and um, and he lost an absolute packet. And so what you have here is the foundations, or almost the formation of the English Opera Group, um, which was to be run independent of Glyndebourne. And you have peers sitting um, next to Britain, Joan Cross, you've got John Piper there, etc. So you've got a really uh, a pretty extraordinary group there. And, and it's around this time that, that he's, he's thinking about this canticle that he'll set and that this opera company that will be formed and funded partly by the Arts Council. The English opera, opera group is a, is a slight sadness, I think, in, in Britain's life because for a period of about 15 years it really did prevent him from doing what he really should have been doing, which is just composing, um, or in this instance, posing for a Life magazine photograph. Um, <laughs> he did most of his composing walking on the beach and thinking about things. I mean, it, he did, of course, have to sit down, but um, not um, posed quite as um, elegantly as that. Um, uh, and so the opera group actually made him, uh, uh, he thrived on it, he thrived on the organisation and, and d doing the bills in his head and writing things down and planning things on, on little scraps of paper. Um, he would be away on tour and, uh, and the, the telegrams and the letters and the phone calls would come through and he'd have to sort of plan for the, for the year to come and, and to deal with whatever latest crisis he'd just encountered. Um, but the fact remains is that it really did take him away from developing a sort of relationship with um, the, the emerging company at Covent Garden. Um, that in itself is interesting because we take it all for granted now that, that, that this is London, this is a capital and would have um, an intensive and successful metropolitan opera scene, but it's not the case and that the touring um, that Britain witnessed in the 1930s um, in England showed that opera was still a pretty primitive art form um, in this country and certainly the appreciation of it. But that all changed. It changed for two things. Um, the, the first production of Peter Grimes in 45, and then also a, an exact, a feeling at exactly this time that um, uh, from John Maynard Keynes who thought that the vanquisher, the, 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 that Britain should have an opera company to, um, to match anything on the continent. And uh, so these two things are happening in parallel. And what does Britain do? Unfortunately, I think he chooses the wrong thing. And, and he decides that standards aren't high enough um, at this new company at Covent Garden um, and that he wants to branch out on his own. And so he branches out twice, don't forget. First of all, in 1946, when he goes down to Glyndebourne, and that falls to pieces. And then again, um, at, at the end of 46 and into 47, where they form the new company. But there are some interesting things along the way. Uh, Two of which are the, the, the success of David Webster, who was um, the first director of, the, um, of the, the company at Covent Garden, the success of him in attracting Britain back to the house a number of times at Covent Garden. Now later Britain would say, uh, look, the problem was only that the standard wasn't very high and there was actually no one to write for um, at Covent Garden. Um, and that's partly true and partly not true. Um, and he said, you know, had I known how quickly a company would have emerged at Covent Garden, um, emulate, if you like, the relationship that people like, that, that Strauss had with Dresden um, or Verdi with La Scala. Uh, so he didn't. He sets out on his own um, in this period. It's curious though, these two episodes, uh, these two episodes where, um, where Britain is brought back into the Opera House at Covent Garden. Um, and the funny thing is that they highlight a tension between Britain and Piers. Um, Piers was actually much more comfortable uh, living in um, the rough and splendour of London. He was a metropolitan man and enjoyed all the excitement that came with that. But here they are in the high street of, um, of Alborough with Mr. Baggett, the butcher. Um, <laughs> and, and again, a very uh, lovely, beautifully posed photograph. Um, I, uh, <laughs> he had a housekeeper <laughs> and, and Britain didn't actually know the, the difference between one end of a carrot and the, and the next. <laughs> but, um, but he... Uh, uh, and this is already in place by, by the late 40s, a sort of tension between uh, the, the pull of the metropolitan, if you like, um, uh, in Piers' life and the attraction of the micropolitan in Britain's life. So, the two occasions where he manages to step out of that are really illustrative of a shift also in English uh, thinking in the 1950s. And the first of these occasions was, of course, the... Uh, the commissioning and first performance of Billy Budd, which, which I believe to be his greatest opera. Um, uh, it was again another sort of happy chance here uh, that E.M. Um, e. Forster 
um, had written about the, the book by Melville, the, the novella by Melville, um, uh, Billy Budd Sailor, and that Britain had, of course, um, uh, got to know uh, Forster a little bit um, after 1945. And so it was um, Forster that was invited to come in and, and uh, join in on this operatic venture. But it was David Webster in Covent Garden that was really pushing him. And it becomes very much an establishment, um, if you like, a commission. It, it's, it's, it's commissioned by the Arts, Arts Council money, um, nowhere near equaling the money that um, Stravinsky managed to extort from La Scala for um, the Rex Progress in the same year. But it was still a decent commissioning fee. Um, it was very much put on, it was written by, of course, uh, by then, you know, the, um, Britain's preeminent composer. It was uh, li with a libretto by one of the grand old men of English letters. It, uh, it had choreography by Krenko, etc., etc. This was a, a, a real sort of affair. Um, and then, uh, sorry, the choreograph choreography by Krenko is, uh, is for, um, uh, for Gloriana, not for <laughs> dancing sailors. Um, <laughs> although, <laughs> uh, and so that's the first of these. Um, it's, it's not a great success, um, uh, but still, uh, it's enough of a sort of critical success in places for Britain to think that this return to grand opera was something worthwhile pursuing. And so in 1952, on holiday with the Earl of Harwood, uh, they start talking about national opera and what, what that means. And I actually think that's a very odd concept, the idea of national opera. But they talked about it and, and what they were for each different country and came up with Meisterzinger for, um, for Germany and they came up with Aida, bizarrely, for Italy. Um, and they said, well, you know, what is it for England? Of course there wasn't one. And so Britain decided to write it. But it was a very telling commission because he decided also that he would only undertake it if it was part of the official um, coronation celebrations and, and so therefore that if it, it was a commission more or less from the Queen herself. Um, and that is a shift in his thinking because by now this outsider um, who had been you know, sort of stamping his feet on the, on the sidelines in 1930s literary and artistic England is now shifting very much closer and closer towards uh, the establishment Britain if you like. Um, the piece is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because he tried, um, he tried to do a number of things for a number of different um, interested groups, if you like. The first of all is he tried to write uh, music in what was now his middle period. This is this um, sort of this mature, dislocated, purcell inflected, um, slightly uh, modal with um, hinges of bitonality. Um, uh, style of music that he was writing at this stage. He wanted to keep true to that, but at the same time, he wanted to uh, reflect the Elizabethan life of the subject of Gloriana. Don't forget he's writing it about um, Elizabeth I, the subject that they settled on, um, having dismissed the idea of writing on Henry VIII, um, for, probably <laughs> for logical reasons. Um, uh, but. Uh, um, and, and so he, he wanted to actually reflect that. And he does it in a number of ways. First of all, he does it in uh, the series of masks, uh, the mask scene where the choral dancers are sung by the chorus. He does it in a really brilliant movement um, uh, towards the end of Act Two where he has um, uh, his own sort of uh, musical language dominating ultimately this rather Elizabethan sound that he emulates in a modern orchestra. And then he does it in these, uh, these two lute songs, which you probably know, they're rather famous, um, and, and, and gets a very, uh, the, the sounds of Elizabethan life, but also very much the sounds of Dowland, which uh, was influencing him at this stage, um, another of his discoveries. And so here then is um, uh, the second of these uh, lute songs, uh, Happy Were He. Bye. 
Um, Harwood later said, of all the operatic disasters um, that he knew of or that were known of, um, this was really one of the worst. And there's, um, there's not much to dispute in that. Uh, it was seen as too sort of down, uh, it was too, too sad an idea and too sort of human a portrait to celebrate the, uh, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And in some senses, that's true. Um, Britain was interested in the private aspects of her, uh, which he contrasted, in, of her life and thoughts, which he contrasted with more, the more ceremonial aspects, which people were, were sort of hoping for. And uh, unfortunately, if they thought they were coming for a, um, a reenactment of Merry England, um, uh, they were sadly mistaken and found in the end of this picture of an aging bald queen, um, toothless, um, lusting after the young Earl of Essex, whom she eventually has to um, sign uh, his death warrant for. So it was seen as uh, something uh, in incredibly uh, dour for such a, an important occasion. The failure of it is interesting um, for a couple of reasons. The first is that uh, in the coronations list, uh, Britain is appointed uh, OM. That's a very prestigious thing. Um, and you have then this, this paradox almost of the insider-outsider um, working very closely, having dinner with the Queen, writing a piece for her coronation, but at the same time wanting to have the privilege of, of uh, sort of throwing mud from the sidelines, if you like. There's an interesting thing that happened, as I started to say before, about uh, 1940s, uh, 1950s Britain. And it was highlighted in a, by the American sociologist Edward Schills, where he just sort of said he'd never seen before, since the court of the mandarins, um, an, uh, an intellectual or an intelligentsia that was so comfortable with the um, ar aristocracy or, if, or, or the establishment, perhaps. And he just sort of said, where was, even in the space of one generation, what had happened to these, these 30s leftist poets that had sort of been stamping their feet and, um, and, and critiquing society with such vehemence? What had happened to them in the space of one generation? Now, Auden, um, whom I talked about last, last time, uh, of course, was very aware of the potential for this and, and sort of had said in 1939, oh, I'm going to leave England because otherwise I'd be, I'd be sucked up by the establishment. Um, and Britain seemed to want to have it both ways, which was on the one hand uh, to have his tea with the Queen, but on the other hand still write works that had very, very sort of troubling undertoes to them. Um, the way he decided to do this um, in, the failure of, uh, in the wake of the failure of Gloriana was to spend more time on his opera group, the English Opera Group um, and the Albra Festival. The Albra Festival was his way of sort of controlling product, if you like. Um, and it was, it was formed in, um, uh, in one of their bright ideas in, in, on tour in 1947 where they were touring over on the continent. Um, this is uh, Piers. Um, uh, Eric Crozier was there working on a libretto with Britain and Britain himself and they just sort of said it's madness that we're having to drive you know these great distances and tour to different countries to perform music why you know why don't we have our own festival our Albra festival and just invite a few of our friends um, gloriously they had good friends so um, uh, the, the standard of what went on in this festival was pretty good but it was an incredibly primitive place in which to try and um, shoehorn a new festival and what you have here is the Jubilee Hall which is a former ice skating rink uh, which they turned into an opera house, a very improbable opera house um, for the occasion. Um, they had a, a church uh, just up the hill um, in which they did recitals. And, uh, and that was more or less it. You know, they, they didn't have the beautiful concert hall that we now know of at Snape. Um, that didn't come until 1967. So he's squeezing, he's squeezing his ideas into this because it allowed him, uh, if you like, to be in charge of it, not have to deal with the incompetent bureaucrats and, and, and all those people that he thought really didn't actually understand music. And it also reinforced this, this notion that we talked about last time that uh, there was something continental about the way Britain uh, wanted to approach music making and composition. Um, and that was only possible, he thought, uh, if he was actually in charge of it. Otherwise, uh, other people would be involved and lessen the impact. So, in the, in the wake of the 1953 debacle, uh, uh, with this audience uh, full of dignitaries who didn't know how to behave at the opera or didn't like what they were encountering, um, Britain thought, OK, I'm going to do more and more for Albra. Um, and one of the pieces that he had, he had put to one side um, Oh, I put that in because he's smiling. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, which is not a strictly fair characterization, but uh, this is the, the premiere of, um, uh, of the Spring Symphony in Holland, and it reinforces that idea of, of having a great success on the continent that he wanted to replicate when he came home. And these incredible um, uh, autograph hunters and, and him just ecstatic with the premiere of this work, which is actually being sung uh, this Sunday um, at Festival Hall. It's, a, it's not done very often. It's, it's a sort of an unusual piece of um, writing, but a very effective one. Um, so he, uh, one of the pieces he'd had to put to one side for the, uh, the writing of, um, this is at the time of Billy Budd, uh, working with uh, Forster on the left and Crozier on the right. Um, we'll get to her. <laughs> um, one of the pieces he had to put aside at the time was um, a, a work for the English Opera Group. Um, and it's quite revealing. He, he had to then again write at great speed when it came down to it because it was a commission for the Viennes Biennale. And, uh, and he had to find a topic very, very quickly. And um, the topic that he plumped for was a Henry James novella, uh, The Turn of the Screw. And uh, he, had, he had heard it as a, in a radio adaptation in the 1930s um, or late 1920s and had been incredibly um, moved by it, this haunting um, ghost story. And he decided it was the perfect opera to set. And of course it was in some senses, a very, very small cast, um, very limited uh, setting. So it was perfect for the opera group and, and for Albra. Um, but it's interesting for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is, uh, as a composer, he tended to do all his thinking, um, not standing like that at the piano, <laughs> um, but he, as I said last time, he, he'd do his thinking um, in walks on the beach, etc., work out his ideas, and then come down and, and put them down onto paper very, very quickly. He'd, he'd use an eraser, um, but very, very few extra sheets of manuscript. But this was one where he actually did have a lot of trouble, and it was with um, his last-minute decision to write a prologue for this opera. And um, you all probably know, uh, and we'll get to the, the prologue as it stands, but it's worthwhile just having a listen to what he came up with um, to begin with. Uh, that shows you a little bit about the speed at which he wrote um, and the wholesale revision that he undertook this time round. So this is the draft prologue that he wrote for his opera of 1954, The Turn of the Screw.
recognize the immense change um, and also the speed with which he, he did jettison just about everything you've heard there. from him at this stage. The person who did sort of uh, record his great ups and downs in this period was Imogen Holst. She was a remarkable creature and we think less of her now as a performing musician, which she was, um, because she spent so much of her time, uh, first of all, working with Britain in the 1950s and very early 1960s and then of course promoting her father, Gustav Holst's music. Um, she was uh, possibly slightly in love with Britain. Um, she was certainly completely infatuated with him in, in his company. Um, but she recorded at this stage uh, an incredible retinue um, uh, of people working with Britain, coming through the Red House, uh, coming through the, the, the house um, uh, on the, on the seafront in Albra. Um, and also the routine, the sheer hard work of a composer who was at his desk um, at 8 or 8.30 in the morning just slogging away at um, uh, whatever piece he was working on at that time. Um, she, also, uh, she also could describe in great detail uh, the drinks that they would have with Puy, the brandy, the, the, <laughs> the whiskey, the, the gin and tonic following a board meeting, the, uh, all of these things. Um, it was really life... Um, devised in sort of an English 1920s um, uh, um, uh, detective story, I think. But um, he, he was sort of, um, uh, uh, in, in this period, post the extraordinary success of The Turn of the Screw, um, which was a, a real hit for a while there, I mean, in the mid-1950s, and a hit for the English opera group. Um, but he was still sort of... Uh, uh, if you like, contracting his, his uh, association with or um, his, his dealings with the, the music establishment as a whole. Um, that comes across in a number of works that he wrote in, in sort of the late 1950s and uh, early 1960s. Um, part of it is at the back of his mind he has this dictum from uh, Frank Bridge that he should be trying to pare down his music. And you can hear that even in the two examples there, um, particularly the, the, uh, the, the final version of The Turn of the Screw, where he comes up with this extraordinary atmosphere of, um, of hissing lamps as, as we're sitting down, gas lamps as we're sitting down to enjoy uh, this ghost story. And he comes up with that amazingly foreboding atmosphere um, in, in this prologue. Um, which is completely absent, I think it's fair to say, in the draft uh, Mark just sang so beautifully. Um, so he was coming up with ideas of trying to, instead of um, pack his music out, is actually compact it down. Um, and the works that I'm thinking of, um, where this changed uh, remarkably, uh, were helped along the way by the ballet that he wrote um, in 1955-56 for Covent Garden, um, the Prince of the Pagodas, which had, like the, 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 the orchestra for Gloriana, um, a very sort of large and uh, um, expanded sound world um, that he was experimenting with. Um, oh, that's actually Joan Cross as uh, Elizabeth I. That's not actually Elizabeth. Um, uh, there we were in Venice. Um, 
so he's, um, he's decided to sort of start to contract things. Um, and even, he, he sort of learnt this from Bridge, but he also had um, the, the idea of Mahler. If, if you've ever performed any Mahler or, or enjoyed listening to Mahler's music, he can write it for fantastically large orchestras. But actually what you often get is this sense of, um, of chamber quality, the, um, the idea of, of, of thin textures um, amidst so many people on a, um, on a stage. And the piece that he uh, experimented in, in sort of almost on Malerian ideas uh, so, so well known to us all um, is the War Requiem. Now the War Requiem is both an experiment, uh, experiment along the Malerian lines that I was talking about using very, very large forces but learning how to um, manage them in often chamber sonorities. But it's also his, his final riposte to the people like Edward Schill who would have thought that he was actually far too close to establishment thinking. Um, in the 1950s, because he decided to write uh, a piece as a commissioned work for the, the new cathedral to be consecrated at, um, uh, next to the bombed cathedral at Coventry. Um, he decided to write this work. They left it completely open to him. They, they offered him, you know, the hundred pounds or whatever it was. Um, <laughs> it was a church commission, after all. <laughs> and, uh, and they left it open to him. They said it can be a symphony, it can be a cantata, it can be anything like that. But Britain had been thinking um, from around the time of the late 1950s of writing what he called a very sort of sad European affair, a, a, a work celebrating or, or highlighting a very sad European affair. And it was this idea of pacifism. Um, now, of course, I was talking last week how uh, the pacifism, when he was writing um, uh, Peter Grimes, actually did cause him to be seen as an outsider. Um, but by 1948 or so, um, it was no longer, there was no longer any stigma attached to being a conscientious objector or a pacifist. And so he decided in, uh, in this commissioned work in the late 1950s that what he'd do is write a big mass. But he wanted not just to sort of leave the mass um, to speak um, unattacked, if you like. He wanted to... He wanted to have a commentary inserted into it, and that's where he came up with the really beautiful idea of interpolating the poems of Wilfred Owen, the First World War poet, um, who famously died just before the end of the war, famously killed just before the end of the war, um, and he wanted to use them um, as, a, uh, as a commentary on uh, the, the Latin text of the Requiem Mass, which was going to be performed um, by the, the large orchestra. So this, is, this was the Marlerian conceit, conceit, if you like. He decided to use uh, the Latin in the, the very large orchestra. He decided to have a small chamber orchestra with um, uh, a tenor and a baritone um, singing uh, the Wilfred Owen poems, and then, for good measure, a boys' choir tucked away um, in, the, in the organ loft. Um, and he wanted all of these things to sort of reflect the other. And it was through this work that he decided that he could, he could both represent uh, the war dead, um, build a monument to them, if you like, in this, uh, uh, in this, in this huge undertaking, and then also uh, to sort of point fingers at those who had um, let that generation of, of Wilfred Owen's generation um, walk into such, sort of such muddy slaughter um, in the First World War. So it was his way of, uh, of having his cake and eating it, if you like, uh, both um, uh, acting out almost as Edward Schulz uh, said he did, which is accepting commissions from, from the great and the good, having tea with the Queen, but also then turning around and, and pointing a finger and saying, no, uh, this wasn't good enough. Um, the, the great example, or one great example, of, of how this technique worked um, in, in the, uh, the war requiem is in the Agnus Dei, um, in which the chorus sings the Latin text, and then you have, of course, the, uh, the tenor singing uh, a Wilfred Owen poem, which sort of uh, uh, contradicts in places the, the Latin, you know, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us.
part of this retreat, if you like, was his move in uh, the late 1950s to a house away from the seafront. And this was also part of his retreat, if you like, from public responsibility almost as a composer. Um, here he is playing tennis with Lawrence van der Post. It's a, it's a, it's a, a big house, um, probably about seven bedrooms at the time, swimming pool, tennis court. Um, but it allowed him to get away from the prying eyes, he called them, of the, um, of the people who had come to, f come to accept his fame um, and the fame of this uh, composer. And he, get, became, he found that sort of um, uh, galling after a while. Um, and so what you have in the 1960s also is a retreat in some senses from his relationship with Peter Pears. Um, it's partly to do with an emotional distance that, that, that had grown uh, as the 50s went on. It's partly that their, that their routines were so different, this, this aspect that I talked about before of Peter Pears really enjoying the, um, uh, the metropolitan life and Britain hating it. Um, and it's partly, of course, that composing is such a solitary activity. But Britain was, was more keen in this stage uh, on the cellist Mr. Slav Rostropovich, whom he heard for the first time in 1960. And it was Rostropovich who, who excited Britain's uh, compositions in this era. It's partly also that it meant that um, if you have the War Requiem in 1962, uh, that's the, sort of the last major work, uh, uh, concert work, if you like, for peers in this decade. Um, uh, and instead you have this string of, uh, literally a <laughs> string of um, works for, for Rostropovich, uh, three cello suites, a sonata and a symphony for cello and orchestra. It's interesting as well that this man who had been so inspired by poetry uh, since he was a young boy um, had uh, finally decided to embrace um, absolute music, if you like, to move away from text as a crutch. Um, but before he did so, there was a, a work that sort of exemplified his, if you like, a farewell to the, the, the metropolitan life, um, a piece he also wrote with Harwood in mind um, for Peter Pears, and it was his Nocturne. And it was this, this notion of anthologizing uh, different poems um, to bring about uh, an overarching narrative that he'd first started doing in the early 1930s. And uh, we talked a little bit about A Boy Was Born as an example of that. And it was here that he decided to do much the same thing. Um, but So you have between the two, and, and we'll get to that, we're, we're, you have between these two poles, if you like, uh, the two different Britons at this stage. Um, a Briton who is, uh, is excited by absolute music, a Briton who is um, moving away slightly emotionally um, from his partner since 1939, Peter Pears, and a Briton actually just wanting to explore uh, new sonorities. Um, I think the concert hall that he built um, uh, in 1967 helped change that. There's Rostropovich and Glina Vishnaskaya, um, a wonderful but quite crazy person. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this move away, this move away from the Metropolitan um, became more and more important. Uh, it, it became more and more important for him then to find a venue. Don't forget the, the small dinky little um, ex-skating rink um, seating 300 people only. Um, was no longer appropriate when you're having artists like Rostropovich come and perform at the festival. And so they find this um, place, which was just down the road from the old mill that he had bought um, in 1938 and refurbished and uh, lived in when he came back in 1942 from America. Um, he'd found this, this mill that was operational up until 1965-66. Uh, and in 66, they clamoured over it and, and thought that could make it quite a good concert hall. And um, indeed it did. Um, which uh, was a concert hall with a really beautiful acoustic, um, would seat 800 people, um, fit a full orchestra if you like. So his, his thinking even in this stage has shifted away from opera that had driven him so sort of ferociously since 1945 or even you know, the couple of years beforehand, um, opened by the Queen, um, uh, burned down, not by the Queen, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, burned down on the, the opening night of the 1969 festival. Um, very, very tragic, um, but rebuilt completely in the space of a year. Um, so this is, this is what's happening. This is actually, uh, this is the carpenter working on um, the, the first version of the Maltings um, before it burnt down. And Britain, 
hearing the acoustic for the first time. If you haven't been there, it's a really, really incredible acoustic, really sort of glossy sound, but it's, it's very, very precise. You can still hear it. And you can see Piers and Derek Sugden, I think, has just been cut out of the picture, um, hearing the, the magic of that acoustic for the first time. So what you have then is, uh, th is Britain sort of moving in a new direction um, in this period. His music becoming slightly more austere. Um, the idea of writing for... Um, for Rostropovich, a man who could literally play anything um, uh, more interesting to him than exploring some of the poetry and opera that had um, stimulated him since the 1930s. So, as his farewell, if you like, before, uh, before we get into what comes, in my mind, uh, in the most interesting part of his life, which is the last six years of his life, um, he did write, as I said, this sort of farewell uh, to Peter Pears. Now, they remained a very sort of committed couple and, and, and there were some very interesting works that were to come for Pears in this last period. But he wrote this anthology of night poems, if you like, called his Nocturne. And uh, a, a lot of people think this is a rather austere piece and, and that actually it, uh, it is far um, inferior to the serenade that he wrote, don't forget, um, in the uh, early 1940s. Um, but I find it actually a more compellingly constructed piece and, um, and he, he uses a sort of a ritonello that returns um, throughout each and he talked about the idea of poetry um, being um, of poetry being uh, of, of night poetry not just being about sort of almost a noct you know, happy nocturnal like nightscape but actually being um, incredibly dangerous as well um, and he, he decided to set one of uh, Shakespeare sonnets um, to finish the piece, which we'll perform. But I thought that what he wrote uh, when he met Richter, and uh, Svastislav Richter in, in the same period that he met Rostropovich, he wrote about what music meant to him. And he, he rarely sort of put these things down on paper. He, he just sort of thought music was meant to be a shared and experienced phenomenon. But he wrote this, and I think that it applies to the piece that Mark's about to sing. The magic comes only with the sounding of the music, with the turning of the written note into sound. And it only comes, or comes most intensely, when the listener is one with the composer, either as a performer himself or as a listener in active sympathy. Simply to read a score in one's armchair is not enough for evoking this quality. Indeed, this magic can be said to consist of just the music, which is not in the score. Sometimes one can be quite daunted when one opens the winter winterizer. There seems to be nothing on the page. One must not exaggerate. The shape of the music in Schubert is clearly visible. What cannot be indicated on the printed page are the innumerable small variants of rhythm and phrasing which make up the, performance, the performer's contribution. In the Winterreiser, it was not possible for Schubert to indicate exactly the length of rests and pauses or the colour of the singer's voice or the clarity or smoothness of consonants. This is the responsibility of each individual performer and at each performance he will make modifications. The composer expects him too. He would be foolish if he did not. For a musical experience needs three human beings at least. It requires a composer, a performer and a listener. And unless these three take part together, there is no musical experience.
and where this led him, you'll see next week. Thank you. <laughs>